What's up everybody, I'm Cody Love and today we are going over my entire post-production workflow. But before we get started, you might be wondering, does this guy have a mustache? Yes, yes I do. Did I recently see Top Gun 2? Absolutely. Are those two things related? I don't know. Has my girlfriend been asking me to rock a mustache for years? Yes. Have I always said that mustaches are creepy and I would never rock one? Absolutely. And lastly, how do I feel now that I have a mustache and have caved? I don't know. So the thing about workflows is that it is specific to you and what you are shooting. This process we are about to go over is not the only way to do it. This is just what I do when I shoot documentaries, commercials, and even YouTube videos to a smaller degree. So you can use this video as a blueprint to develop your own style or just do exactly the same thing. Also, this is a guide, so I'm not going to get into the technical details of each step. We'll do that in future videos, but this is more of a map or a checklist for you to use and take from it what you will. So I've broken my post-production process down into 12 steps that take you from the moment you wrap on set to a finished beautiful video. Let's get it started with the most important and vital step in the whole post-production process, and that is step number one, like and subscribe. Just kidding, number one is storage and organization. So as soon as you finish shooting, you need to back up your footage. I normally do this as soon as I get home from set, if not on set, if you have the time and a hard drive and a computer there with you. I back up all of my footage and audio onto external hard drives. There are a lot of great brands for these hard drives like Lacey, Western Digital, and Seagate. I've used all of them and have never had an issue. Now the most important part about this is to back it all up in an organized fashion. So if a stranger got a hold of your hard drive, they would have no problem plugging it and locating your files. This is important because as you work on bigger projects, you might actually have be passing hard drives around to different departments and they'll need to be able to locate all the files and find what they need. Step number two is setting up your project file. So I use Premiere Pro and when I create a new project, I wanna make sure that all of the camera settings and frame rates for my sequences in that project match my footage. So if on set I was shooting at 23.976 frames per second and my sequence is set to 24 frames per second, then everything will feel just a little bit off. So the easiest way to make sure it's all matching is by dragging your footage here and creating a sequence that way. That makes it so the sequence is automatically set up to match that footage. So in your Premiere Pro project, you also wanna keep your footage very organized. So I try to match it to my hard drive as close as possible. And that's why you do so much organization in step one, so that when you get to the Premiere Pro project file, you can just drag everything over and it's all matched up. The last point of step two is to create proxies if necessary. Proxies are a low res version of all of your footage that you can edit with so that your computer can process all of the footage faster and take up less bandwidth. So you do your edit with your low res proxy files and then when your project is complete, you toggle the proxies off back to full resolution for the export. Step number three is syncing the audio and transcribing. So when I shoot, I almost always shoot B-roll and then have a two camera interview set up where I need to sync those files to the audio. So I go through all of my interviews and create multi-cam source sequences. What that does is it syncs up the audio and cameras into one file and then I can toggle back and forth between cameras and they're synced to the good quality audio and it's all ready to edit. Once all the interviews are synced up and ready to go, that is when you would send it off to a transcriber to transcribe it all on paper, which just helps you edit bigger projects. I don't normally transcribe for most commercial work and especially YouTube videos, but when I'm working on bigger documentaries, it really helps to have the interviews written out on paper. Step number four is making selects, and this is one of the most important steps to take before you start editing. Creating selects is the process of going through all of your B-roll and sifting it through and cutting it down to your very best usable clips, so that way when you're ready to edit, you have a lineup of all the best clips ready to just be dropped in. I like to make a new sequence called selects and bring all of my B-roll into that timeline, start cutting it down from there to find the best shots for the project. Step number five is the radio edit. So far steps one through four would be considered assistant editing. So all of the organizing, syncing, transcribing, processing, getting all of the footage ready for the actual editor to come in and start the edit. The radio edit is getting the story structure and a full outline of the whole project with just the interview. So that if you were just listening to it, like on the radio, see what I did there? the story would make sense and it would flow without the visuals. So this can be a very time consuming part of your edit because sometimes it can mean cutting three two hour long interviews down to a tight 20 minutes and sometimes it can be as simple as cutting a few extra lines out of your YouTube video. But either way, the foundation and story for the edit is laid out into your sequence 
that you can then color in with B-roll and music, which is step number six. Generally, I will start at the beginning of my radio edit and try to find what the mood is for that particular scene and then match music to that. I will source through tons of music using sites like Soundstripe or Storyblocks where you can get the licenses and the rights to use that music and then I will cut in the B-roll after that. I normally will find the music first because my style of editing is heavily influenced by the song and that gives me further direction on the pace and cuts that I make in that particular scene. Then I just continue that process throughout going scene by scene and layering in the music and the B-roll as needed. So steps five and six could easily be wrapped up into one step just called editing, but I broke it down into separate steps to provide some clarity, but it's very much based off your own style. I know people who skip the radio edit altogether and just start editing it all at once, but for me, the radio edit lets me see kind of the full picture of the story and then that gives me further direction and inspiration on the rest of the edit. Now step seven through 10 is where if you were working on a big project with teams and departments and all of that big budget studio stuff, then it would probably all get sent out and be worked on simultaneously. But for most of the projects I work on as an independent filmmaker, and probably you if you're watching this, those are not the projects that we are probably working on. So here is the order that I get these next steps done in. So step number seven is motion graphics. And this is where you get all of your titles, graphics, overlays, After Effects transitions, all of that fun stuff that makes the project very exciting done. So I mainly work on documentaries and commercials. I'm not working on Star Wars or big Marvel movies where I need a ton of special effects but I do use titles and overlays and some very simple visual effects. And so I just stick to Premiere to get that done. Um, if I wanna do anything fancy, like shoot lightning out of my fingertips, if you saw my last video, um, I bring it over to After Effects and do that editing in there. After Effects is also the industry standard platform for all of this. So if you want to take your edits to a whole nother level, Spend some time learning After Effects and getting good in there and you can create some amazing stuff. Step number eight is color correction and color grading. So a lot of people think those are actually the same thing, but they're actually two separate steps to getting your footage to look the way you want. Color correction is the process of fixing any issues your footage has with white balance, exposure, and contrast, trying to make it look as natural as possible and consistent throughout your whole project. It's a very technical process and it's less about style and creativity and more just about accuracy and consistency throughout. Color grading is the next step and this is where you add a real look and style to your project. One of the most famous examples of a color grade is when the first Matrix movie came out and there was that green hue over all of the footage when they're actually in the matrix, the fake world. And they did that to make you feel like it's a little unnatural and like possibly you're looking through a computer screen. There's a lot of platforms to both color correct and color grade your footage. DaVinci Resolve is kind of the most popular and uh, industry standard. I generally stick to Premiere and do my color correction in Premiere. And then for simpler projects, I'll just put a LUT over my color correction, something that I like and matches the vibe of the project. And what a LUT is, is a LUT is a preset or a filter like for photos, just for video. For bigger documentary projects, I will hire a colorist to come in and do a pro level color grade in a software like DaVinci. But for most of my projects, I stick to Premiere. Step number nine is a quality check, also sometimes known as finishing or mastering. You should really probably do this throughout your project as you're going through these steps, but definitely when you get to step nine, go through your whole project, watch it with a close eye, make sure that you're happy with everything you've done so far, and it's all good to go. Step number 10 is the sound design and sound mixing. So this is where you go through all of your sound effects, music, interview, dialogue, ambient sound, making sure they're all at the right levels and sounding clean and crisp. Sound is one of the tricky parts in filmmaking, especially for beginners, because when the sound is perfect, you won't notice it. And if the sound is a little off, it brings the production quality way down. Now for this, you can do the basics in Premiere Pro, and that's what I do for a lot of my smaller projects. But for my bigger projects, I'll send it over to my sound engineer and he makes it sound incredible. And then he uses the industry standard platform Pro Tools. The reason I put this step last in the editing process is because if you're working with a sound engineer, they're going to take your full project file and sync it all up and give you back one master audio track that is perfectly synced to your final project. So you wanna make sure your picture is locked and you don't make any final edits after you get the master audio file or else it won't sync up and you'll have to do it again. Step number 11 is exporting. So your project is all done and you've created a masterpiece 
and it's time to get your project out to the world so they can all see your creative genius. But first you have to make sure you export it with the right settings so that your masterpiece doesn't end up looking like your mom's cat video that she filmed on her iPhone. So really there are two ways that I export my videos. One is the highest possible quality and two is the best format to upload online. So watch this. Okay, so we're in Premiere and now we want to export. So let's just do a little export right here, in and out. So I just want to export. So I want to export from here to here and I want to do that with the highest quality settings. Then I'm going to go export media. Title it here, YouTube sample. So for the highest quality, we're going to choose the QuickTime format. And then we're going to go up here to the preset and we are going to go to more presets. Premiere changed their layout to like kind of make it simpler, but we want to go to Apple ProRes 422. If you really want to go real fancy Apple ProRes 422 HQ, which is the highest you can do. And that's it. Quick time Apple ProRes 422 and then hit export. And that is the highest quality you can do. Okay, so now let's say we want to do that same clip, but we want to upload it to YouTube. So we want to put it in the best format for online. Then for the best settings for online, we will go to format and make sure it's, we set this to H.264. We go high quality 1080p, or if it's in 4K, you can do 4K. Um, this is like a TikTok crop right now, so it doesn't really make any sense. Let's name it again. YouTube sample. And then also you wanna make sure it's going to the right place. So if you wanna change the location, you can click here and pick where you want to save it in your finder. And that's it, that's it for online, export. The final step number 12 is uploading and archiving. Make sure you have a backed up version of your final project. So whether that's on an external hard drive or on a online storage system like Dropbox or Frame.io, that way you always have an archived high quality version of your project that you can reference, use for your portfolio or any other future uses you might need. And then most importantly, with another copy of your final project, submit it to your client, send it to a film festival, upload it to YouTube, do whatever you gotta do, but showcase your work. That's it, that is my full post-production workflow. So hopefully this video helped you understand the overall post-production process, and hopefully you can take some things and design your own workflow so that you can make something great and keep on keeping on. Check out my YouTube channel, 660 subscribers, pretty nice, pretty nice. Like and subscribe, of course, if you haven't already, what the f